Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out on such a horrible night. Um, and welcome to this, the last of the uh, lectures in the Medical Detectives Lecture Series. Uh, let me first introduce myself. I, I'm Dorothy Crawford, an assistant principal of the University for Public Understanding of Medicine, uh, which, of course, this lecture is a very good example of. Um, the inspiration behind this series of lectures, for those of you who haven't been previously, um, is, of course, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was a medical student at the university here from 1876 to 1881. The jury seems to be out as to whether he actually sat in this lecture theatre, but it's certainly true to say that this, um, the so-called new medical school, was actually being built uh, while he was a student here. Um, and he, he and his family actually lived in George Square, just around the back there, so he had a very comfortable walk to work. Um, he wasn't all that keen on medicine, one has to say, but he was clearly um, somebody who had a very astute, very astute powers of observation. And he used those powers of observation uh, when he invented his uh, detective, Sherlock Holmes, who was apparently modelled on some of his teachers of the day, uh, particularly Joseph Bell, who, who was a physician at the time. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker for this evening, Jamie Davis, here. Um, Jamie uh, got, uh, well, studied um, natural sciences at. Uh, Cambridge and remained at Cambridge to do his PhD. Um, he arrived in Edinburgh as a lecturer in 1995 and uh, has moved very rapidly up the ranks uh, so that he gained his chair here in experimental anatomy in um, 2007. Uh, Jamie's research interest is particularly in um, how organs organize themselves um, and, and how cells organize themselves into organs, I should say, particularly in the fetus. And his long-term aim is to use what he learns from his research, perhaps to be able to modern, model organs in tissue culture for those who require them because they have failing organs. Um, so without more ado, um, I'll hand over to Jamie, who's going to give us a talk on cracking the cell code, how we build vital organs. Jamie, over to you. detective. Famously, there is the brilliant lone private investigator, such as Sherlock Holmes, who could take a seemingly insignificant tiny piece of evidence and build a watertight case. There is the skilled amateur, ranging from Brother Cadvile in the 12th century to, for example, Miss Marple in the last century, who would busybody themselves into other people's lives and solve mysteries that the police could not come near. And then there are fictional detectives who are policemen, such as D.I. Rebus of This Fair City. Those of you who read his books will know that in the falls, one of his critical interviews takes place right here at the end of this desk, where he interviews a medical student. As there are many kinds of fictional crime detectives, so there are many kinds of medical detectives. And if you've been coming to this series, you'll have heard of, from, um, from people who have been speaking from a perspective of working very close to patients and working on one specific disease and trying to identify the one particular poison or bacterium or whatever responsible for that disease and what to do about it. And that's one kind of immensely valuable medical detective. And then there are other medical detectives who step back and who ask very general questions about how the body works in the hope that understanding more about how bodies work will open up vistas of opportunity for doing something about bodies that aren't working too well. So this last talk in the series is going to be about that kind of detection process, asking a big basic question about bodies, and then seeing how that can take us towards doing something practical for people who need help. So our big basic question is about how you can move from a very, very simple structure, like the fertilized egg at the top left of this picture, through some cell division, through cells becoming more specialized, through cells altering their shapes and their relations, to a simple embryo like the one on the bottom left of this picture, which is already really quite a complicated structure, right the way through to the baby born at the end of the picture, and even beyond the baby to the sort of individual who's got such a complex brain that they're not only independent, 
but they can come to a lecture theater and look at a picture being projected and ask deep questions about why they came from. And that kind of, that kind of big question is our inspiration for the work that we do, but it is a very big question. It's one of the biggest in science, and it's, it's in that form, it's too large to be able to tackle head on. Well, Conan Doyle's detective had some useful advice for those of us faced with big questions, which is essentially, if you're faced with a very big and difficult question, try to work on a small part of it. Start with the elementary bits, you've got some chance of understanding. And there are lots of different ways that you could split up the big question about how the body forms. So, for example, some of my colleagues work on questions like, why does one end know, how to make, know that it should make a head and the other end make a posterior? Or why is it that we've got two arms and two legs and not some arbitrary number or some huge number like a millipede? Or why is it that we're bilaterally symmetrical so that we're roughly um, mirror images on each side? We're not, for example, like, like a jellyfish, which has got radial symmetry, or we're not spiral, like a snail. And those are very important questions about the whole body. What I've been working on with my, with my group and with all of my colleagues is a different level of question. We're interested in the minutiae of things. We're interested to know how tissues form, because tissues tend to be very um, intricate arrangements of different cell types that have to work very closely together in order to do the things that our bodies do. And tissues are interesting for a special reason. On this, um, on this slide, you can see there are two fingerprints. It's a good detective connection that was unintended, actually. There are two fingerprints, and they look different. It would be easy if one of these individuals left their fingerprint on a wine glass for you to look at the fingerprints and work out which individual it was, assuming you had these pictures. But they happen to be identical twins, these people. If you did so-called genetic fingerprinting, if you studied their genes, they'd be exactly the same because they come from exactly the same initial embryo. But yet, at a fine scale, their tissues differ. And that's starting to hint at an important point that although we talk about genetic blueprints, actually, genes don't specify everything about how a body forms. The large tree-like object over um, onto the right of the screen um, depicts the airways of a human lung. And again, that's just essentially a branch tree, and everybody's lungs branch in roughly the same way. If somebody showed somebody who knows about anatomy a picture like this, they'd instantly know, ah, this is a human lung. But even with twins, the exact shape of those branching trees isn't the same. Again, it makes the same point, point as the fingerprints, that, that we're not just turning genes into, directly into a set anatomy. The last picture shows the airways of a rat lung. Rat lungs are very similar to human lungs. The pictures are approximately to scale. And the reason they're both there is they make the obvious point that human lungs have got far more branches in their airways than rat lungs have. If, in some way, genes were specifying anatomy so that, so that they were specifying every little bit, then you'd expect to make a bigger branch structure in a lung, or a kidney, or a liver, or whatever, but let's stick to the lung for a moment, then you'd need far more genes to be able to specify it because there are far more branches there. But actually, humans and rats have about the same number of genes. And that's another indication that we can't just settle back on some explanation, oh, well, the anatomy comes from the genetic blueprint, move on. Something much more interesting is happening here. And that's one of the other reasons that we want to work in this area, partly because, as, as um, Professor Crawford said, generating new tissues is very important um, medically, but partly because understanding how tissues are generated is, is at the heart of a big mystery about how you go from genes to the final body. Well, as well as the piece of advice from Conan Doyle, which, which you've already read at the top of the slide, another piece of advice, not from a detective, but from a poet, applies very nicely to those of us who work in science. And this is a quotation from William Blake's Auguries of Innocence, and talks about seeing the world in a grain of sand, and eternity in an hour, and so forth. And what that suggests is that it can be very valuable to take, if you have a big question, to find a microcosm, a grain of sand, that you can look at, you can hold in your hand. And you can study the grain of sand and get answers from that that can then tell you something about the way the whole world works. So it isn't just a question of taking a big problem but only working on one little bit of it. It's a question on choosing a little bit of it that can tell you a great deal about the whole problem. And that's something which is fairly universal in science. It's, it's the way that we struggle with complicated problems. So our favorite little bit of it is the kidney. 
And the one picture up here is from Gray's Anatomy, and it just shows in color the positions of the kidneys in a human in the lumbar part of the back. The other picture, the rotating movie, is an image of a mouse kidney which shows some of the internal anatomy. And it's partly just to illustrate the anatomy is somewhat complicated. There's a lot going on inside there. And also, to be honest, it's to show off a new sort of microscopy that's been developed in Edinburgh, and the university is quite proud of this. The structure inside a kidney is essentially a plumber's paradise. It's just a mass of pipes. And the pipes are arranged in a particular way. So behind me, there are, um, th there are millions of these pipes, but, but I've just drawn a few in color on top of an old image from Gray's Anatomy, a book so old that Conan Doyle would have been using it in his studies. The green set of pipes forms a drainage system for the urine that the kidney makes, and that is a tree, and we'll talk quite a lot about that tree in a moment. The blue structures are called nephrons. One end of them filters blood, the glomerulus end, and then the filtrate passes along the tube where things that you don't want to lose from your body are recovered, and finally what is turning into urine is removed by that green branched collecting duct system. And the tubes, although in no two individuals are the tubes arranged in exactly the same way, so you could take a photograph of one and lay it on the photograph of another, statistically, they've got a very, very clear arrangement. Those blue tubes always extend to make loops in the direction shown. There are always relationships between the blue and the green tubes that are statistically similar all the way through. So this is a system where we think we can study it to ask how does all of this similarity happen and then understand something about how, how tissues form in general. The next slide gives another reason. It's the only slide that may be a little bit off-putting, so I've got the warning here. The other reason for working on kidneys is that kidneys have problems in some people. So this slide shows examples of kidneys that are polycystic. That means that, that what should have been those very fine tubes have blown up to make huge fluid-filled cysts because we now know essentially the cells in the tubes have lost their sense of direction and they don't understand the difference between growing out this way and elongating to make a fine tube that way. And these cysts end up taking the whole of the volume of the kidney and squeezing out the good tissue. And people who suffer this and a lot of other renal diseases end up in the position that they have to have their diseased kidneys removed typically, and they're kept alive on dialysis, which is a, a wonderful technique, but it's not much fun, in the hope that they may get a transplant one day. And as I'm sure you all know, there's a great shortage of transplants and there are problems of not getting transplants rejected. And for this reason, it would be very nice if we could understand how kidneys are built enough that we could build new kidney tissue to help people who have this sort of problem. Okay, if you were looking away, it's safe to look again now. This picture illustrates, it's a movie taken by my colleagues in the MRC Human Genetics Unit, Peter Hochenstein and Rachel Berry, and it shows a kidney which has been removed from a mouse embryo and put in a Petri dish. And if you do that under the right conditions, the kidney's very happy to grow. And I'm showing you the movie because apart from the fact that it shows you how kidneys start to grow, it makes two very important points that make this system attractive for us. One of them is the very fact you can see the growth happening there tells you the kidney doesn't need any special influences in the rest of the embryo. The, what, whatever the kidney needs, the kidney is enough to provide it. And that removes a huge headache for us because it means that if we study kidney formation, we can concentrate on the kidney and we can forget about everything else that's going on in a very complicated embryo doing thousands of other very complicated things. The second thing, which is a major plus, is that it means we can do an awful lot of our experiments in that Petri dish so that we can interfere with kidney development in particular ways to test ideas and we don't have to do the experiments in the context of a living animal. And this cuts down the numbers of animal experiments, and it's something this university in particular is putting a lot of effort into, to trying to find ways of doing... We'll never be able to eliminate animal experiments. There are sometimes there's only one way to do it. But as far as possible, we want to find ways of doing our research without having to do animal experiments and put off the time that we finally have to verify it in a, in a complete living animal. So the kidney starts off a very, very simple structure, essentially two cell types. So in the colored picture, there are the cells that are colored green, which are, it's, it's a structure called the ureteric bud, and that will make the tree-like urine collecting ducts. And then the cells that are only colored, colored red, I apologize if anyone's red, green, colorblind, but there won't be many of these, uh, of these images. Um, the cells that are only colored red are called mesenchymal cells, and the mesenchymal cells, some of them will remain mesenchyme forever, 
and others will go on to form the structure in the cartoon that's blue. That's the structure that will make the nephrons. And the, that's as, as, apart from the blood system that comes in from outside, this is all you need to start the kidney going. So here is a plea that any scientist would recognize from, from Sherlock Holmes, which is just a desperation for information. And we're very lucky in Edinburgh because we sit right in the middle of a huge international project which is funded by the National Institutes of Health um, in the USA. And what the project is designed to do is to find information about all of the changing anatomy of a de developing kidney and also of what proteins are expressed in every cell type all the way through kidney development. So the, the project funds laboratories in the USA and in Australia who make large-scale studies of literally tens of thousands of types of gene in hundreds of different cell types in dozens of different time points. And they spray megabytes of data towards us, and we run a database that looks after it all. And it's all freely available. If you, if you Google that word, good map, you can have a look at the data yourself. It will be somewhat dry reading, I suspect, but it's there and it's available for everybody. And it's very useful because it means that we are, we are getting data fire-hosed at us down a fiber optic cable all the time. So we have plenty of information and it keeps coming. Well, what I want to do is to illustrate how we, how we do our detection work, given this information. And what I'm going to do, although we work on all sorts of parts of the kidney, I want to concentrate just on this one, which is the branched urine collecting duct system, because it's, a nice, it's, it's very easy visually to see what's going on. You can see in this movie um, by a collaborator, Frank Costatini, how the, how the branching happens. It really is just like a tree. It's a whole kidney on here, but the only tissue you can see is, is, the, is the collecting duct system because it's been genetically engineered to fluoresce in this particular mouse. And this kind of branching, partly I've chosen, I've chosen this as the example in the kidney because it's easy to see the shape, partly because it's the kind of thing that lots of organs do. So all of these branch systems you can see in red on this slide have developed, as far as we know, essentially the same way. It's a very common way of making a mammalian organ. So our question, our simple question is, what controls the growth and branching of this? And here, I'm going to part company with the great Conan Doyle and, and Sherlock Holmes. At least three times in the Sherlock Holmes stories, Sherlock Holmes gives the strong advice that one should not start coming up with conjectures and hypotheses and guessing. You should just rely on the data. Twice, he says it is a capital mistake to theorize. The third time, he's even clearer. Do not guess. Um, or never guess, I'm sorry. Never guess. It's a shocking habit. Well, as a, the, other, the other part of having data firehosed at it is it's easy to drown in the stuff. And for this reason, I rather part company with the idea of just letting it all mount up. Other detectives are available. So I thought I'd read around some other detectives to see if they came up with any better advice. And another kind of detective who'd be very familiar to you all is the gumshoe type of detective from the middle years of the 20th century. You know the sort of thing. That kind of detective populated a thousand pulp fiction books or the sorts of black and white film noir movies that would be on on a Sunday winter afternoon now on BBC Two, where you'd see them in, in rundown offices. There'd be some sort of, uh, you know, an old trench coat hanging up behind, a detective wearing a 1940s suit, fedora thrown carelessly over the furniture, wise cracking and often wise words. My favorite of these is Louis Knight. I don't know if anyone else has heard of Louis Knight. He's an invention of Malcolm Price, who has written a very strange stories, a whole series of books in a strange world, which is a sort of dark alter ego of my homeland. This is one of his books, Last Tango and Aberystwyth, where Louis Knight has to investigate a murder in the context of a town split by a terrible gang feud between the Druids and the Women's Institute <laughs> for who should control the vice industry that makes the what the butler saw machines for the end of the pier. And Louis Knight came out with a wonderful piece of advice Every detective needs a hunch. And that's more the way that we operate. Never mind all this waiting around, just letting all the information mount up. Let's guess. Let's enjoy guessing. So we apply that. Oh, sorry, I should say, Louis Knight is not alone. One of the most famous philosophers of science, um, Karl Popper, said much the same thing. So Popper is famous for two things, really. One of them is, as an undergraduate, he angered the philosopher Wittgenstein so much 
that Wittgenstein came and attacked him with a poker in a Cambridge Moral Science Club meeting in about 1920. And Popper's other claim to fame is he wrote a book called Conjecture and Refutation, in which he suggested that the way that science really operates is that scientists come out with guesses, theories, hypotheses, and then they subject them to experiments, which, if the guesses are wrong, will refute them and will give a clear, no, you got that one wrong, move on, answer. And any theories which, if you keep on trying to prove them wrong, you never do manage, we sort of start provisionally to believe in as probably right. So conjecture and refutation is a polysyllabic philosopher's way of saying the same thing as Louis Knight. Every detective needs a hunch. So our hunch is about this system. Given that we have these cells that are producing very fine-grained tissues, we know it isn't just reading a genetic blueprint. There's too much variability. But neither can it be cells that are too incompetent to read a blueprint properly, because in that case, we'd expect a mess, not a beautifully arranged set of tissues, set, sets of cells, so that one pipe is just next to the right other tube, but their exact placement in the organ isn't reproducible. So we have to find some way that we have a beautifully arranged tissue, but not just reading from a blueprint. And one of the guesses we can make is that the cells talk to each other so that they can organize themselves in much the same way that people trying to get up the stairs are organizing either speaking or just exchanging looks to work out who's going to go through the door first to organize yourselves to get into here. So in the specific context of making these branched tubules, what we're going to do is, first of all, start with a guess there is communication going on. And in this specific case, we'll take a guess that the cells that surround the branching tubes are going to talk to the branching tubes. So having made that guess, we look at our data and we ask, are there any examples in our data of a signaling molecule which is made by the cells that surround the tubes that will branch, but the receptors we already know are capable of detecting that signaling molecule are expressed by the cells that are in the tubes that will branch, because that's what we need for a signaling system. So having looked at that and having got some candidates from all of these thousands of pieces of data that we have, we can then subject our conjecture to a test to see if we refute it or not. So we can test whether the signaling seems to be important two ways. One of them is we can simply interrupt the signal. If the signal is important in patterning the way the branching happens, then if we interrupt the signal, the branching should go wrong in some way that we can observe. The other thing we can do is to create a false source of signal, and that way see if, you know, if, we, if we give the signal from the wrong place, do we then make a predictable change in the branching? And this sort of thing, the strange pictures there do return to Conan Doyle, because for all of his words about not guessing, actually twice Sherlock Holmes had to try to crack a cipher in his stories, and in at least one of those occasions, he wrote a message in the cipher to see if he could change the behavior of anybody capable of reading the cipher and thus identified the person who was reading the cipher and cracked the case. So we're essentially using that approach. In this slide, um, and I just need to move back here to use a pointer. In this slide, um, this picture here is an ordinary view through a kidney, and the little yellow dotted lines are outlining the branching ureteric bud, because it's a bit difficult to see. The picture next to it is exactly the same section, but illuminated a different way, so that you see silver grains. And the way this has been stained, silver grains will appear if a specific receptor, which is called RET, but that isn't very important, just if the receptor is expressed. So you can see the silver grains are hanging around here, right next to, or right on top of, where the tips are. So this receptor is being expressed by the tips of this branching tree. RET is a receptor for a molecule called GDNF, and GDNF is expressed in a quite different way. So again, the d yellow dotted line shows where this budding tree is. You can see the tree itself is quite dark here, but the cells around it are expressing lots of GDNF and giving lots of silver grains. So these are set up in exactly the way that we'd expect something to be set up if it were going to be signaling. So we can do one of our tests. We can interrupt the signal. So what we're going to do here is we use an antibody which binds to the GDNF molecule, and it physically gets in the way of GDNF then binding its receptor, because antibodies are large molecules, and they just simply get in the way. 
And if we do that, to start with as a control experiment, we grow kidneys in irrelevant antibodies. That's the left-hand picture. There, we're seeing perfectly ordinary branching happening. The antibodies have nothing to do with GDNF. That's just a test to make sure that antibodies per se aren't going to do anything to branching. And the picture on the right is an antibody that specifically blocks the interaction between GDNF, our guest signal, and RET, our guest receptor. And when we do that, we see that branching now fails. We still get growth. Those arms are still growing nice and long, but they're just growing out without ever branching, which is pretty good evidence that our guess in this particular case was right. A whole load of them are wrong, of course, but I'm only presenting one that was right. The other thing we can do is we can apply false signals of GDNF by putting GDNF on little beads that will slowly release it in the culture system. So here, you're seeing a bead which is soaked in GDNF put next to one of these tubes, and you can see it's eliciting a little branch coming out towards it. Whereas beads soaked in irrelevant other signaling proteins that are nothing to do with this story don't do that. Or down here, here is a bead soaked in GDNF which is being which has been put next to a growing kidney, an intact kidney, and you can see there's lots of branching coming out towards the bead, whereas a control bead with irrelevant proteins on has no effect. So that kind of thing, by, by, making, um, by, by blocking signals or by giving false signals, we can test our guesses and start to build up pictures of signaling. This particular photograph, th th this particular cartoon, is drawing together that set of work and lots of similar pieces of work, exactly the same detective process, done by us and also done by collaborating groups around the world. And what this is doing, what it's representing, the ureteric bud, which is this branching structure, is shown in purple here. These are the cells I've already shown you are mesenchyme. These are the ones I've already named. And they are making this signal called GDNF. They're also making a signal which says, this is the one that says branch. They're also making a separate signal that says grow. And they also happen to be making an enzyme which the ureteric bud can switch on and which helps the bud clear space so it actually can get space to grow. Otherwise, it would just jam up against cells and stop. But in a whole set of signals that were identified using the same tricks, but I'm not going to spend time talking about them, the ureteric bud, when it reaches these cells, commands some of them to stop being just a rabble of mesenchyme, but to start grouping together and making either nephrons or supportive cells called stroma. When the cells do this, they stop making these signals they used to make. They start to make new signals. Again, the colors match the, t the tissue and the signal. They start to make new signals that say things like, keep out, do not send a branch here, or yes, please elongate, please get to be a longer tube, but don't branch out here. This makes a kind of sense because as all of this is happening, the last thing these cells want when they're making a nephron is some great big branch from the ureteric bud to come charging through them, messing things up. We'll return, so th this is just an illustration that there are lots of different signals going on here. We'll return to a slightly modified version of this cartoon in a moment. This is another movie of kidneys growing. This time, you can only see the ureteric bud, the branching structure, again, because it's a genetically engineered system, and that's the only one that's fluorescing. And as this grows, what's obvious is that we don't get collisions. So here, for example, where there are tips that are growing towards each other, they never actually seem to hit. And that's a bit of a surprise. And even the real surprise is that if we take a ureteric bud and we grow it on its own with no other cells around, and we give it GDNF so it's happy and it thinks it should branch, then we still don't get any collisions. So for itself, the ureteric bud is capable of avoiding collisions. And we can, we can start to measure this. So these are measurements from this actual movie. And this is a measurement up here. This is the speed of growth of the ends of one of these branches. So the higher a point is up this axis, the faster the, the, the branch is growing. This is the growth speed of branches that are growing out into free space with no risk of collision. And essentially, they're growing fast. As we move to the left in the graph, we're looking at a closer and closer and closer distance between the tip that we're looking at and another one. And as we move to the left, you can see all of these values come down and down and down, because as they're getting closer, they're slowing down. And actually, the sharp-eyed will notice that right on the left-hand side of the graph, 
the line actually goes negative, because if something's happening in the kidney to try to push these together, they'll back away. They really don't like being very close. So we can take another guess about that. We can imagine that if they hate being close so much, perhaps they're repelled by each other. And here we can take, I, I'm using this to illustrate another way of, of exploring things, which is not to do experiments at all at first, but just to set up models of developing systems on a computer. So this particular computer program, at no point was anything told to make a tree in the computer program. What it was told is that ureteric bud is going to obey a very specific, the model ureteric bud is going to obey some rules. To start with, its tips are going to release a substance, which I've called horrid in this particular thing. It's a repulsive substance, but I don't want to nail us down to particular molecules, so let's call it horrid. And you can see in the right-hand frame of this movie, um, that's, that's it's a contour map of how much horrid is around. So red means lots, and blue means less, and so forth, and black means very little. And the, the tips, the computer has these simple rules. The growing tips will grow fastest where there is little horrid, and they'll slow down where there's lots of horrid. They will always grow in the direction that takes them as much as they can away from horrid, so always to the lowest concentration they can find. And when there's a very low concentration, they'll make a branch. And with that system, if you just run it normally, you get something that looks very much like a kidney. If we look at the real behavior of how these things slow down as they approach, which is the dotted line in this graph, the graph is the one you've seen before with the real data, but the dotted pink line is the prediction of the computer program. And you can see actually what real life does in the dots and what the computer program and the dotted pink line suggests are remarkably similar to each other. We can play further games on a computer. So for example, we can say, let's just take an arbitrary length from the middle of one of these branching structures and leave it and see what happens. And this computer idealization would say, well, if you do that, a very unnatural thing to do, it wouldn't happen in normal embryonic life, that you'd expect to see a tree growing out from both ends. If we look at real life, that's exactly what we see. This is a short length which we cut out, and we're getting a tree growing from both ends something that wouldn't normally happen, but a nice validation that we, we may be on the right lines here. Similarly, if we set up two trees in the computer so that they're likely to hit each other, so we've got two in this system now, and they ought to be hitting each other here, you can see because of the influence of all this horrid building up, they're not going to get any closer, and they avoid each other. Again, I set this actual example up a couple of weeks ago. If we set up real kidneys and try to make them collide, they won't. They're just stopping growing, and you can just see a line, a kind of, you know, uneasy standoff and a no man's land between them where they will not go. And we can even go further. I mean, given that the computer is suggesting there is this substance which we nicknamed horrid being produced, and if we assume that's true, we correctly predict what the kidneys really do when in real life we mimic our little computer toy experiments, we can in real life say, well, maybe this is real, maybe this is true, perhaps we can find something that inhibits the production, uh, so, oh, sorry, that inhibits the cell's ability to be able to, to detect the horrid signal. So um, we went raiding all of our colleagues' fridges for as many drugs as they were prepared to give us that inhibit particular pathways, and we found one that if we put on the kidneys, we now get collisions. Because it seems now that these, these tubes are growing out blindly and are perfectly happy to run into each other because they can no longer detect the horrid. They also grow very long very quickly. Again, we predict that. If we think that horrid is what's slowing them down and they don't like it, if they can't detect it, they'll just go for it. And that's what they seem to do. So we've added to our simple model one extra signal, which is a go-away signal, or similar phrase, between two of these, b b between these tips. And the point about this kind of arrangement is that with all of these cells communicating to each other, and as I said, I've only put in the signals here that seem to shape how this branching system operates. There are lots of signals that shape how this lower half operates as well, but this slide's getting confusing enough as it is. With these signals, we're getting a remarkable system forming here. Because structures like these, these mesenchymal cells that have not yet been visited by the growing branching ureteric bud, are still producing branch signals and growing signals. So anywhere in the kidney that this has somehow missed out even, will still be making, please branch here, please come here signals, and will eventually be served. Once this has reached some of these cells and is making these cells make nephrons, 
They're making clear signals saying, okay, don't come here anymore. Go on, keep growing straight. Go and meet more of these things. Persuade them to make new generations of nephrons, make more branches, keep growing outwards. So without any of these cells having to have a map, without any of these cells having to know where it is in the kidney, really, without any of the cells having to have a, an overview of how the whole organ is forming, we can get a structure forming itself Branching tubes always going to the right place and never the wrong place, and these cells moving from, 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 from the yellow to the other structures according to the signals they're getting. So the point about all of this is all we need are fairly stupid agents, the cells, operating some very simple rules. I'll make this signal, and if I feel that signal, I will do this. And that's what you need to get tissues to organize themselves. Now, of course, what the genes are really doing, the genes are coding for the proteins that are these signals and these receptors. It isn't that the genes don't matter, but the genes operate by constructing the proteins that run this mechanism. And then the mechanism makes the anatomy. It isn't we go genes anatomy. We go genes interesting cellular conversation, and cellular conversations generate the anatomy. Right at the beginning, those of you who, who were sitting here before the talk started, the movie that you were looking at was Flocking Starlings. And the reason it was there is that one of the, the easy, you know, human scale type things that you can see um, that follows a similar pattern of organization is a flock of birds. So in a flock of birds, there is no bird in charge. The birds don't have any particular idea about what the whole flock looks like to those of us who are watching. What happens in the flock of birds is that individual birds follow fairly simple rules. Depending on what their neighbors are doing, they will fly this way or that way or speed up or slow down. But the net effect is that spectacular display of the, of the starlings dance that you saw at the beginning and this little still picture here. So in the left-hand picture, you're seeing a convenient scale of birds, individual agents following simple rules in a dumb way, doing something utterly remarkable. And in the right-hand picture, you're seeing a whole bunch of kidney cells, individual agents doing something in a dumb way with remarkable final results, producing spectacularly complicated anatomies. And this is actually one of the sort of unifying principles of modern biology. You can go right down to individual molecules, which of course are fairly dumb things, they're just chemicals, that bring themselves together following the simple rules of physical chemistry. And we move up to cells that by communicating with each other are just following simple rules, but doing something remarkable. And then entire organisms, such as the birds, themselves constructed, of course, by cells doing remarkable things, that do the same idea, simple agents following simple rules, but all the feedback in the system makes it remarkable. All you have to do is to go up the Scott Monument and look down on Princess Street, and you'll see pedestrians doing much the same thing, as with none of them having to read a choreography, they all manage to get through the Christmas crowds without mowing each other down or being run over, mostly. So that's, that's the kind of, that's what we learned from our basic scientific question of how do tissues organize themselves, and it seems that, that lots of conversations and simple rules, that's the message we're getting back. Can we use this medically? As I said, it would be very valuable to be able to construct new tissues. And I was thinking for some years about how we might use this and then to the laboratory came um, a young postdoctoral fellow called Mathieu Ambercant, who took a wonderfully literal-minded approach. And he just sort of said, look, if you're right about all this self-organization, you should just be able to take a developing organ to pieces, just to individual cells that have nothing to do with each other anymore, throw them together in a completely random way, and if you're right, they'll do something remarkable, and they'll organize themselves into tissue. And I kind of thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> I should have thought of that years ago. Um, so that's exactly what he did. And in this picture, you can see a cartoon on the top of what he was doing. So to start with some embryonic mouse kidneys, to reduce them to individual cells, and the photograph, the real photographs on the left show you it really is just a suspension of individual cells there. Throw them together any old how, just, just by putting them in a centrifuge tube and spinning them hard so that they form a great lump at the bottom of the tube. And then watch, see what happens. And the, these other pictures just here are simply um, examples of differently stained cells to show it really is a completely random mix in here. If you just do that in the simple-minded way I said, the cells all die because mammalian cells don't like 
being on their own, and they tend to kill themselves out of a loneliness process called anaikis. But Mathieu managed to develop a drug system that would, would just tide them over for just a few hours until they got back again together and then could take the drug away, and that saved their lives. So if he did that, what you see here is just an ordinary, you know, bright light view of the random mix of cells. And then a day later, two days later, three days later, and so forth, you can see quite spontaneously structure is starting to form in there. And if we stain this with stains that, we, that I've already been showing you that show different parts of the kidney, you can see inside that we've got beautiful branched um, ureteric bud and, and urine collecting duct systems forming, shown in green. And around them, just shown in red, we've got nephrons starting to form. And if we look at high, at high magnification, these nephrons are, I mean, you have to take my word for this, I suppose, but they're, they're forming exactly the structures we see in normal embryonic development of the kidney. And all the way along here, these, these colors are just stains for different proteins that are characteristic of developing kidneys. And the bottom line is they're all expressed at the right time in the right place. These two pictures, this is a real embryonic kidney over on the right. The one on the left is one of our tissue-engineered, re-aggregated pieces of tissue. And although the real kidney's got its beautiful round shape and the engineered one hasn't, apart from that, the internal anatomies are basically the same. These cells really have, despite the fact that we started them as a random mess, organized themselves beautifully into something very much like kidney tissue. We can also go on and ask, are they making all of the kidney cells they're supposed to? Well, really, the only important part of this slide is in the red box. All of the other bits of that picture are just controls to make sure our technique's working properly. And what this slide is showing, a lot, down, these words that are coming down here are different cell types in the kidney. And each of these cell types expresses different proteins. And what we've done here is chosen a protein which is expressed uniquely in this cell type. So for example, this one called claudinate is only expressed in the descending thick limb. This one, aquaporin II, is only expressed in the collecting duct principal cell. The details of the cells don't matter. The point is that if we look in our tissue-engineered re-aggregated kidneys, every one of these is being made, suggesting that every one of the types of cell that should be in these tubes is actually being formed properly. There isn't a blood system in here. As I said, that comes from outside. A kidney without a blood system, a tissue-engineered kidney without a blood system, would be completely useless. I mean, the main point of a kidney is that it filters blood. It does a few other things, but, but the really big task that, that you're needing kidneys to do is filter your blood. Right now, a fifth of the output of your heart is going through your kidneys. Um, they, they, they take a huge amount of blood, and they clean it up. So what we'd need to do to, make, to, to find this, our system any use is to give it a blood system. And recently, um, we've been starting to explore a, a way of doing that, just as a test, just as a basic test of principle. And this uses chicken eggs. So this is a perfectly ordinary chicken egg here. And its shell has been removed of the top half. And this is a little chicken embryo. So this is going to be its head. That will be its tail. It's far too young to have formed wings and legs and things yet. But what it's formed in, on a membrane that goes across the top of the yolk is a very rich blood system. This is entirely normal. This is what birds do. That's the blood system that will take nutrients from the yolk and will take oxygen from the air. And what two people my lab, Guangping Tai and Shi Hong Chang, who is doing an MSc here, have done is taken these re-aggregated engineered kidneys and simply put them onto this membrane and asked what happens. And when they do that, you can see this is just a bright field view. I'll show you a, a, a section in a moment. But this is the lump of re-aggregated kidney. And you can see lots of blood vessels are streaming in here, <coughs> suggesting it's making something that's attractive to blood. Now, this kind of view doesn't tell us where they're going. The next kind of view does. This little colored picture shows a structure called a glomerulus. So this is the actual filter. This is a part of a normal human kidney, this, this colored one. This is the normal filtering apparatus um, that filters blood. And it's a sort of very strange, frothy structure inside a cyst called the Bowman's capsule, which is part of the nephron. This black and white picture is part of the, the system of the engineered kidney rudiment put onto the chick. And you can see here, these are the beginnings of glomeruli. They don't form if you don't have blood systems. So this is strongly suggesting we, don't, we not only have a blood system coming into this, but it's even going to the right place and starting to form a filtration unit. 
We don't yet know if the filtration unit works, although Shi Hong is coming back to do a PhD, and one of the things he wants to do is to use the fact that this chick embryo is actually pumping blood to see whether this really works as a kidney. The last part of the work I want to talk about, we've been talking about tissue um, regeneration, and people talk a lot about stem cells when they talk about regenerating tissues, because stem cells are cells that can multiply a lot, and they have the property they can turn into a lot of different cell types. And they're relatively easy to get hold of. So the great hope of tissue engineering is that we can take stem cells, and if we can persuade them to be the right kind of tissue, maybe they'd be a way to be able to make the tissues we want. So the thing is, everything I've shown you so far, we've had to go from fetal mouse kidneys, and we can't get fetal human kidneys to make, to make new kidneys. There's no ethical way of doing that. But what we can do is use our system to test the ability of stem cells to make kidney. So on the left, this is just a picture of the normal system I've already shown you. Start with mouse kidneys, break them up into individual cells, and then put them together so that they make a tissue-engineered kidney. But we can add, because these cells are just floating about disconnected to each other, at this stage, we can add some disconnected stem cells in and see what they make. And Veronica Ganeva, who's in the audience at the moment, um, pioneered this, this particular approach. So what we can do is put different types of stem cells. We can test anything we like. So for example, embryonic stem cells um, or, or some others I'll tell you about and ask, can they make kidney? Well, actually, embryonic stem cells, which are the ones people talk about a lot and the ones that cause such controversy in the USA, in our hands are completely useless at it. It could just be we don't have the knack. But we found a different source of stem cells that are brilliant, and they don't have all of the ethical problems. They're called amniotic fluid stem cells. Amniotic fluid is this substance you can see in this slide that surrounds a, a growing human fetus and acts as a kind of shock absorber inside a membrane. And amniotic fluid is sampled for various reasons um, during, during some pregnancies. And some collaborators with us in Vienna can get hold of lots of human amniotic cells and culture them as stem cells. And if we mix those in with our kidneys, then what we see, and in this particular case, the human amniotic fluid stem cells are green, we see that the green cells, which are human, are joining in with the non-green cells, which are the mouse, to make the structures of the kidney. So it looks as if, I mean, anatomically, they're integrating. We can also look at the expression of different genes that are characteristic of kidney, again, just being shown as different stains here. And the human cells seem to be making the genes that are characteristic of growing kidneys. Um, and our hope now is, and when we take structures like this that are mainly, mainly made from human, what we're trying to do now is to develop a system to take these, take them back to individual cells, separate the human and the mouse cells in the hope the human cells now know they're supposed to be making kidney, bring just the human cells together and say, can we now make an all-human tissue-engineered kidney, which we think would be quite an exciting thing to do. Now, I'm in no way saying, oh, clinical use is just around the corner. It's not. This is fairly basic research. It's the beginning, hopefully, of a new way of building organs. It's absolutely not going to be one of these things that will be in your local hospital in a few years. And I don't want to go send you away with that impression. But I do want to send you away with an impression of what basic science can do to open up new areas for medicine. In my last but one slide, I want to thank a lot of people. Um, although I happen to have shown you quite a lot of photographs of experiments I've done myself, my, 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 all of my work depends on having a lot of people around. In the University of Edinburgh, we're very lucky. We're one of the world's leading research universities for medical research. And that means that people from all around the world compete to come here to study and to do research. And I've had the great good fortune to work from, with, with a wonderful bunch of people from all around the world um, who've been working on this and other projects. Um, the main photograph, it's slightly out of date, but I wanted to thank some people who've contributed to what I've told you. The main photograph shows my lab as it was a couple of years ago. There are a couple of new arrivals who were shown as extras. And then we've got intensely valued collaborators in the human genetics unit across town and at Little France, I'm just almost out of town. And we've been receiving funding from a lot of different government bodies and also critically from charities. If you have ever given something to a medical charity shop, if you've ever put a coin into a shaken bucket or bought anything from the shop or made any other contribution such as sponsored diving and custard or whatever, I'm genuinely very, very grateful for what you've done because we can't do this work without you. 
The last part of what I said was all to do with, with medicine and with application. So for my last slide, I'm going to show you some words from an author who lived at almost exactly the same time as Conan Doyle, and who, like Conan Doyle, was a doctor. His name was Anton Chekhov, and he, he came out with a quotation which I think is, is a wonderful um, evocation of why it's important just to do basic science. So I'm going to give you a few moments when I put the slide up to read his quotation in your own voice in your head before I come out with my final words. Those words are, for me, a wonderful statement of why we scientists bother to put our white coats on in the morning and why some of you who are young enough to be thinking about what career you should choose might want to think about putting on a white coat for the rest of your lives. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention. Well, Jamie, I think everybody will agree with me that that was an absolute tour de force and a real model of clarity. Uh, my niece, who was a student here a few years ago, said to me, Jamie Davis is the best lecturer I've had, and now I agree with her. So it was wonderful. And I, I'm sure uh, there are questions out there, and we have a few minutes. Um, so if anybody would like to ask a question, please raise your hand, and we will bring you a microphone. Thank you for a wonderful lecture, Jamie. Is there any indication that your re-aggregated engineered tissues would be able to integrate into an adult host? Um, no, there is no indication. So as I said, we are trying to, we're trying to do as many of our experiments as we can outside um, working on living animals and move to the living animals as the last possible resort. We'll have to do it one day, we know. So that's why we're prioritizing finding out can they get a blood supply, is the blood supply doing the right thing? because there's no point in putting them into an adult animal and then having it all failing because we didn't even check that. So we're going to find out about the blood first. But obviously, if all of these things check out in our culture systems, in our, in our chicken egg systems, then we will have to move into an adult mouse and say, OK, can this integrate? But so it's, it's, it's suggested because cancer, cancers will uh, recruit their own blood supply. So. Yes, but we're interested not just in a blood supply to keep the tissue alive, but, but blood which will go into form a glomerulus and will actually be filtered. And that, there's, a, there's a second layer of rather complicated blood capillaries in the kidney as well, and that also has to be right for, for kidneys to work. So we're, we're going to test all of that outside an animal before we go into one, but it's a very valid question. One of the other things that, that has been done, not by us, but by other people in living mice, is, the, is grafting in embryonic kidneys, letting them grow for a while, removing the adult kidney and then showing the mouse can survive for quite a long time on the, on the grown-up embryonic ones. And that's why we think we may not have to build anything the size of an adult kidney. If our engineered system can build something as good as an embryonic kidney, that might actually be enough. You showed us some fascinating videos of uh, these tubes growing in the tissue culture. I just was interested to know um, the time frame of that. Ah, yes. The videos, they were running from beginning to end about five days. So we get a, a one branching event roughly every 10 hours. So they were speeded up. The birds weren't. The kidneys were. And is that about what you'd get in the embryo? Or? It's a little bit slower. So the, one of the big differences, though, in a dish, we're growing essentially two-dimensionally. Everything's flat, whereas in an embryo, of course, it's three-dimensional. Yeah, right. Anyone else? And some animals regenerate their own bits naturally, yes. don't they? Yes. Are there any clues there that would help in the direction we've been looking? Yes. Um, so, so the big clue is that those animals seem to be capable of going from mature tissue states to very immature tissue states characteristic of the embryo easily. Um, so everything up to, in evolutionary terms, everything up to about amphibians are very good at that. But beyond, reptiles, mammals, and birds are really not very good at it. And people are, at the moment, working very intensively to be able to work out, can we persuade our kinds of tissues to easily slip back in time to make an embryonic state that can then go forwards again to build new? But 
there is always hanging over this field the awkward question, is there a good reason that we lost that ability? So many years ago, before I worked on kidneys, I used to work on brain development. And the clinical spin-off of what we were doing was hope, hopefully allowing brains to regenerate, you know, for example, after there's been a stroke or, or a lesion of a spinal cord to let, let nerves grow back. But always haunting us then, and I think still haunting people to some extent, is if you release all of the inhibition of regrowth that's in an adult brain, what would happen to the person, to the memories, to the personality? How much would change, and how much would you actually want to change? So we don't yet know whether there's a good reason that we're terrible at rebuilding ourselves. I hope there isn't a good reason. And if there is, we'll just have to work around it. <laughs> oh, a question right up at the back. Can you... Yeah, I was wondering about the proteins and signals. How many different organs does that work for? So that particular protein that I was talking about, GDNF, is used in about three organs. It's used in the kidney, it's used in the gut, and it's used in the brain. But the general principle of proteins, of cell signaling to each other using proteins, that's universal as far as we can tell. It's just a different protein. We have about 2,500 different proteins that we can use that way. And different tissues use different ones, but the idea is the same. It's a bit like humans speaking different languages, but the idea of human communication is the same. Yeah, so then, in theory, if you can grow a kidney, you could be able to grow any organ, including the brain. <laughs> Indeed, the brain might be a tough one. <laughs> we're, at the moment, following Holmes's dictum, we're sticking to the simple stuff. But um, we've already been doing experiments on lung, for example, and we're starting experiments on testis because that may be of interest to people who are trying to keep rare breeds going because, because we can, our system allows us to grow organs from different sources of cells. We could, in principle, make a testis from an easy-to-obtain animal like a cow, but have it making sperm characteristic of a fantastically rare breed, which may be of interest to zoos. You never know. It's fun to think of these Frankenstein things of a dark afternoon. <laughs> OK, so could you just join with me in thanking Jamie again for an absolutely marvellous lecture? This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.